the experience of our, our country, the experience of the races and the experiences that we had uh, trying to get to the point where we were. And it, it was understood that uh, young people had to understand the history. They had to understand the history of the family and they had to understand the history of, of the community because by sharing this information with the young people, we knew that they knew that they were preparing us to take our role and to take our place in helping to uplift the family and helping to uplift the community and helping, helping to uplift the race. So my father was a, uh, he was an artist. He graduated from the Chicago Art Institute. My mother was a classical pianist. And so we grew up listening to these stories all the time. And the stories that I remember the most, well, first of all, let me say, I lived in the house of my great-great-grandmother, who was born in 1867. And uh, we heard her stories, you know, her stories about her mother, who was a slave. You know, I got a chance to be around my grandparents on both sides of my family and hearing their constant stories about their experiences with racism and their experiences of growing up and their experiences uh, that their grandparents had to go through. Uh, but my father uh, shared a, a lot of stories and he, he talks about his stories when uh, World War II broke out and uh, he was captain of the ROTC and he runs down to the induction center and he sell, says that he wants to join the, uh, the army and he's told that we don't take boys like you. Well, when he graduated, they were waiting for him, not just waiting for him, but they were waiting for other black soldiers. And all of a sudden, all these black soldiers were recruited into a segregated uh, military at that time. My father tells the story of how they were all the black soldiers were put on a train, and the, the windows were closed down on the train, and they had an M painted on their helmet, and they thought they were going maybe to Missouri or Michigan or Minnesota, but as they found out, they were going to Mississippi. And in the 40s, Mississippi was a very bad place for black people, particularly if you had a military uniform on, and that was enough to incite violence against you. So it was very dangerous for these black soldiers to be in the South uh, while they were getting trained before they were sent off to war. So he shared many of those stories. And some of those stories, one of the stories is that him and his, uh, my father and his black uh, companions were out uh, marching in the hot Mississippi sun. And they come across a farm. And they knew that in order to keep from going through the swamps, that they uh, could circumvent that by marching across the farmer's field. So the white commanding officer asked permission uh, to march across the field. And the farmer points a shotgun at, at the black soldiers and says, no niggers are going to march across my field. So they marched into the swamps and they camped not far away. And my father and some of his black soldiers' companions went back and burned down the barn of the black farmer. He tells another story of where they were preparing to go out on furlough. My father and his fellow soldiers were preparing to go out on furlough for the weekend. And, uh, you know, the soldiers look forward to going out on furlough for the weekend so they can go into town and relax and have a good time and, and meet some, some girls and, you know. Uh, but as they were preparing, uh, a commanding officer comes in and tells them that their furlough is canceled and that they have to uh, clean the latrine of the white soldiers. But these, these men were from Chicago and they weren't used to that. And so they, they proceeded to have a riot, and they started burning uh, their furniture and throwing out in the courtyard. This riot lasted for about three days until they were finally shipped away. But uh, when my father got to World War II, he fought in the Philippines, and he fought in Okinawa, and he saw something that would change his, his life forever, that would change the way that he looked at his country. He saw a white Marine cut off the breast of a Japanese, dead Japanese woman and hold it up in the air and yell. And this incited my father to the point that he grabbed his rifle and he tried to shoot the Marine and he was stopped by his fellow officers, fellow soldiers. And he was, uh, he went on furlough, he went 
AWOL after that, and eventually came back and, and was shipped back to the United States. But this had a tremendous effect on him because he was prepared to die for his country, but when he saw the atrocities that were being committed by American soldiers, he, he began to question his commitment and uh, his allegiance to his country. And so uh, he began to get involved in other political organizations. And that's pretty much how my family, uh, our, our parents raised us. That they never mentioned, they never mentioned hatred against anybody. They, you know, we, we, we were raised to uh, respect and love all types of people because my father uh, was the type of person who was really, he was really interested in other people and other cultures. So we had a lot of different people that came into our home and came and were part of our family who were from a lot of different races and a lot of different communities. But my parents did not like injustice. And uh, they made that very clear to us. So when I was uh, very young, I had an opportunity to march with Martin Luther King. I had an opportunity to participate in uh, uh, civil rights protests and civil, civil rights demonstrations. I went on numerous marches and demonstrations. When I uh, was in the ninth grade, and they started this program called Voluntary Busing, School Busing Program, I volunteered to uh, bus myself along with some other black students to an all-white uh, high school. Because the, the, the idea was for black students to integrate white high schools. So I, I did that. And of course that experience didn't, didn't, didn't turn out very well because I really ran into the brick wall of racism. And I eventually came back to the community and graduated <coughs> from the school that all my friends went to. So. Um, I also uh, found myself at the University of Washington uh, in 1967, and uh, there were only 30 black students there at the time. Uh, we started the first black student union uh, on the, on, on the, in the Northwest at the University of Washington. And um, we had, were doing some organizing in the community as well. We led a demonstration at a local high school uh, where black students were, were, were being unjustly uh, kicked out of school, and uh, for that uh, we were arrested and uh, found ourselves in uh, King County Jail in Seattle, Washington. And while we were sitting in jail, the day was April 4th, uh, Walter Conkright comes on the news and announces that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And of course, uh, this was devastating news for us. Because as they announced the death of Martin Luther King, they began to show the riots that began to break out all across America in anger of the death of Martin Luther King. And of course we were angry because we couldn't be out there as well expressing our anger. We had to be sitting in that stuffy King County Jail. And I remember that night, I remember going back to my bunk, and I remember saying to myself, that my, my picket sign was going to be replaced. It was going to be replaced by a gun. I wasn't going to picket or demonstrate anymore. And um, I didn't realize that all across the country, young people were thinking the same thing. White students, uh, Latino students, Asian students, Native American students, because we all grew up with Martin Luther King. We all understood that Martin Luther King was a man of love. He was a man of peace. I was trying to create a better life for everyone, not just for black people, for everyone. And they killed him, they assassinated him. And, um, and, and when they killed Martin Luther King, they killed the Civil Rights Movement. Now, I, even earlier before that, we had witnessed the death of John F. Kennedy, the first Irish Catholic president elected to the United States presidency. And he was someone that him and his brother, Robert Kennedy, they had shown an interest in helping uh, support the, the, the civil rights uh, fight to end integration, uh, to end segregation in the South. And so a lot of black people in the black community really loved John F. Kennedy. And that's the first time I ever saw my father cry when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And so that had a, a tremendous effect on, on, on us.
But two years later, Edgar Evers was assassinated as well. He was one of the leaders of the civil rights group, one of the most powerful leaders of the civil rights group. He was assassinated. A year later, Malcolm X is assassinated. When Malcolm X is assassinated, uh, Bobby Seale and Huey B. Newton in Oakland, California, uh, decide that they need to create an organization to take off where Malcolm X had left off. Because Malcolm X was in the process of creating this organization in Harvard. And so they started the Black Panther Party as, as, as a, a natural progression to take off where Malcolm left. And the Black Panther Party, in those early years, named the Black Panther Party for self-defense because they wanted to focus on the violence that was taking place against black people uh, in Oakland and San Francisco and L.A. and throughout America. And Huey Newton was a law student, and he believed very strongly in the Constitution of the United States. So he uh, wanted to focus on the Second Amendment of the Constitution. The Second Amendment of the Constitution says everybody has the right to bear arms. So the, one of the first things that the Black Panther Party did was, with its members, only 30 members at the time, was uh, to, besides other things, that they wanted to focus on the brutality and murder happening against black people. So they decided to arm themselves. Because it says in the Constitution, everybody got the right to bear arms. So they, so they went out and got some legal weapons. They learned the laws, the gun laws. And they decided to go out on the street and start patrolling the police. And when they stopped a black person, they would get out of their cars with their rifles and shotguns. Let the police officer knew that they understood the law. They could stand 15 feet away and observe what was going on. It would also inform the black person that was being stopped that, uh, that they only had to give their name, address, and the social security number. And so this went on for a period of time before uh, Huey was eventually uh, cornered one night and shot and wounded, and he had to defend himself. And the police was killed, and another police was wounded. And he was put in prison and was threatened with being sent to the gas chamber. So uh, when Martin Luther King is assassinated, uh, we finally get out of jail. Uh, we go to Oakland, and uh, we, we went to a Black Student Union conference, and we met Bobby Seale, and we started the first Black Panther Party chapter outside of the state of California. And um, the first Panther to join the Black Panther Party was a young man named Little Bobby Hutton. Little Bobby Hutton was 14 years old. He reminded me so much of a lot of young people today. At 14 years old, he realized he didn't know how to read, he didn't know how to write, even though he had been in school for a number of years, and he became disillusioned. He dropped out of school, and he met Bobby, and he met Huey, and he became the first recruit of the Black Panther Party at 14 years old. And while his time in the Black Panther Party, he learned how to read, he learned how to write, he learned how to do math, and eventually, by 17 years old, he became the finance uh, minister of the Black Panther Party, Dora Bobby Hutton. Now, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, Panthers in Oakland, uh, when Huey was in prison and Bobby Seale was in jail, they decided they were going to confront the police because of the death of Martin Luther King. I mean, everybody was angry about Martin Luther King getting killed. Of course, that the Black Panther Party never would have sanctioned going out on the streets and doing anything about it. But because of the anger uh, that, that took hold because of Martin's uh, uh, assassination, members of the Black Panther Party decided that they were going to go out on the street and seek revenge. And in the process, little Bobby Hutton uh, and, and Elvis Cleaver get cornered in, in a house. Uh, thousands of rounds are poured into the house. And they finally realize they have to surrender. They come out with their hands up, little Bobby Hutton's told to be told to run to the police car, and when he does, he shot 25 times, shot and killed at 17 years old, the first to join the Black Panther Party and the first to die at 17. So when we went down to open to the Black Student Union conference, they were having Bobby Hutton's funeral. And so we heard about him, went over to open and went to the funeral. When we drove up, we saw Marlon Brando standing out front with a black leather jacket on and a, and a, a black beret. Mark, Mark um, he was very much a, 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 a very much an activist, Marlon Brando was.
So we, we go into the church and we see little Bobby Hutton's body in the casket. And uh, we hear the crying and the moaning of Bobby Hutton's family. It was very emotional. We saw the Panthers standing around the church on the, up against the walls in the Black Panther Party uniforms on black leather jacket, black beret, powder blue shirt, black pants. And, uh, and we decided, my brother and other comrades decided that we wanted to have a Black Panther Party chapter in Seattle. And a week later, we had the first chapter outside of the state of California. And we started working on it. I got a call. I was still a student at the University where I got a call uh, from Bobby Seal. Chairman Bobby Seal tells me to come down to Oakland. Uh, so I fly down to Oakland. First time I ever flew in an airplane. I was very nervous. Uh, I'm still a student. Uh, you know, uh, wondering if I'm going to fit into this organization of these rough and tough uh, brothers and sisters uh, who were members of the Black Panther Party. I get picked up at the airport by Two Panthers, Robert Bay, uh, who was a Vietnam vet, Tommy Jones, who was also a Vietnam vet, and uh, taken over to Oakland. And uh, you know, we go to Central Headquarters, uh, the Black Panther Party office, and um, and I'm taken around the corner to where Robert Bay lives in the house with two other Panthers, Captain Landon Williams and Captain uh, uh, Randy Williams. And both these two brothers had been in Vietnam. They were Special Forces in Vietnam, they came right back from Vietnam and joined the Black Panther Party. And so they were happy to see me, they were happy to realize, learn that they had a chapter, a new chapter outside of California, and I was greeted very warmly. Uh, but immediately they, they are so excited, they run into their rooms, and they come back out and start showing me their technical equipment. Technical equipment is the word we use for guns. And so they're showing me their different weapons that they have, and their showing me uh, the reloading equipment. And um, then I, I spent some time with Bobby Seale going to different meetings. I end up in San Francisco at the Field Marshal's house, Don Cox, the Field Marshal of the Black Panther Party for a Central Committee meeting. When I get there, Stokely Carmichael was there as well. So Carmichael had been drafted into the Black Panther Party at this point along with James Foreman and, and uh, H. Rap Brown. And uh, Stokely Carmichael was the one that really uh, lit the fire under me and thousands of uh, young, other young people to realize that we had uh, to develop stronger, uh, more, um, more radical uh, organizations and movements. So I was really excited to be in there with, uh, with Stokely. And, um, and then I have to go out and sell newspapers of the Black Panther Party because the Black Panther newspaper we realized was, was one of the most important elements that we had because we were taught in the Black Panther Party that power is the ability to define phenomena and make it act in a desired manner. And what that means is that if you are able to define the phenomena happening around you, that you have the power to make changes. You have the power to do something to affect the phenomena that happens around you. And that's why our newspaper was so important. Because our newspaper, we were able to define the phenomena that was happening around us, not the main media that was taking place. So, um, so the next day I go back to the house and uh, I'm with Robert Bay and Landon and Randy and uh, they decided to introduce me to uh, the Panther drink, which was called Bitter Dog on the streets. Uh, the Panthers soon dubbed it Panther Piss, which was dark pork wine and lemon juice. And so uh, we're, we're, we're drinking Bitter Dog. Then they said, okay, Aaron, you want some Brother Ruby? I said, what's Brother Ruby? They said, well, that's the code name for marijuana. So then we started you know, smoking some Brother Ruby. And uh, now Landon is not in there with us. He's in watching TV because Landon doesn't drink or smoke. And so, you know, I'm starting to relax now. I, you know, talk with Brother Judy, and I'm feeling more comfortable with, with these uh, with these comrades. And then we hear a loud bang. We hear this loud bam. And we run into the front room, and Robert Bay said, man, what's wrong, man, what happened? And Landon is sitting there, and he says, man, I got tired of watching cowboys and Indians, and the Indians always get killed. So he took his 44 Magnum and blew his TV out. <laughs> 
That was meant meant to respond to something he got tired of seeing. So, uh, so, you know, we said, let's go get something. So we go down to West Oak and we get something to eat. We're, you know, West Oak Friday night, everybody's out spending their welfare checks. Everybody's out there having a good time. And, um, and uh, me and this young Panther named Orlando, we finish eating. So we go outside to smoke a cool cigarette, which was the movement cigarette at that time. So we're all smoking our cool cigarettes. And, and then a police car drives up. Now, Lan uh, Orlando's only 16 years old. He's been in the party since he was 14. And uh, he sees a, a, now this is only a week later after little Bobby Hutton had been killed. So there's a lot of tension on the streets between the Panthers and, um, and the police, because not only was little Bobby Hutton killed, but also 18 Panthers were arrested and uh, put in prison. Elvis Cleaver, also the Minister of Information, was wounded and arrested as well. So there's a lot of tension. So Orlando starts yelling. He starts yelling at this police car. He said, and, and you know, we had created a name for the police. The name was Pig, an avaricious pig. That's what we call police. And so a police car pulls up and Matt Orlando starts yelling, pig, pig, you damn pig, you better stop at that stop sign. So I joined in, you know, because we're both young and stupid and foolish. So I'm yelling too, you know, pigs, pig, you better stop at that damn stop sign. So um, police car goes around the corner and calls for backup. And pretty soon, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight police cars start showing up. And um, they start jumping out of their cars and we start hearing in the, and, and we could hear people in the community yelling, saying, man, I got to get home. There's going to be a shootout. Because on that very same corner, 7th and Wood was where Huey P. Newton had a shootout with the police. And so people are running home, and, and shops start closing, and pretty soon the streets is, is, is emptying up of the people that were out there. And Robert Bay and Landon and Tommy and, and Randy, they come outside, and pretty soon the streets are empty. And, and the only people who are there are the prostitutes. The prostitutes say, we ain't going nowhere. We're going to stay out, stay out here and see what happens to our brothers. And, um, and I remember uh, Robert Bay said, spread out in his deep voice. And so we spread out. Everybody's armed. I just was given a, a, a handgun earlier that day uh, with the holster. So we're all armed. So the police are all bunched together. You can tell that they have a lot of fear. Uh, they have, they're exhibiting much more fear than what we are exhibiting. And so we spread out. And uh, I see this, uh, you know, I'm starting getting really scared, really nervous. You know, I'm, damn, I'm, I'm here, I'm a student at the University of Washington, and you know, I start thinking about my childhood and thinking about my family and thinking, now oh, what have I got myself into? And I see this young guy with a McClyman's letter jacket on, and he's got a bag of groceries, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking real hard, I'm looking at him, I'm saying to myself, damn, I wish he would stay here and help us. And he looks at me, our eyes meet, and he says, I will stay here and help you, brother, but I got to get home. And he's gone. And I remember just feeling like, damn, you know, we've been deserted. And so the police uh, direct their attention at, at us, and, and particularly Landon Williams, who's kind of standing out in front of us. And one of the police officers is, See, he must have been in Vietnam fair because he's not showing no fear at all. He's got his hand on his gun. He starts walking toward Landon. He starts telling Landon, I'm going to search you. And Landon starts backing up. No, you're not going to search me. And, and this goes on for a few seconds. And I just remember, you know, we've all got our hands on our guns. And I've, I've just decided that tonight is the night I'm going to die. I'm going to probably die out here. But I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And, um, and, and so this fear is, is gripping everybody out there. And so as Landon is backing up, as Landon is backing up, he trips over a garbage can top and it reverberates. And I remember hearing that garbage can top reverberating. And Landon, um, and, and, the, and a strange thing happened. The police stopped what they were doing. They didn't say a word. They just stopped. They got in their cars and they drove off. And that was my baptism into the Black Panther Party. Was we had drawn the line in the sand that we were not going to surrender ourselves uh, and we were not going to be threatened by the police. And we were going to stand out there 
and, uh, and do whatever we needed to do to stand our ground. And that's what we did that night. We gave our guns to the prostitutes because we figured the police would come back with reinforcements. Um, and we knew the prostitutes knew all the members of the party, so we were able to get those guns back. But um, the very next day, I am at the, uh, I go to the Panther weekly meeting down on St. Augustine's Church. And Panthers from all over the Bay Area are there, from uh, uh, Marin County, uh, San Francisco, Palo Alto, Richmond, all over. And I remember how exciting it was to be in this room with 150 men and women of the Black Panther Party and, uh, and, and being introduced as a, as a captain from the Chicago chapter, a Seattle chapter, excuse me. And, um, and so after the meeting is over, Robert Bay and Tommy Jones and I hopped in our car and we headed back to the house. When we get back to the house, uh, the phone rings, Robert Bay runs into the house, he picks the phone up to says, yeah. He slams it down, he runs into his room, he grabs some rifles and a, a box of ammo, he comes out, he says, the pigs are ramping on the comrades at the church. So we hop in, in the car, he says, he says, Dixie, you know how to load that weapon? And I said, yeah. Even though I didn't, I never saw that type of weapon before, 44 Magnum, but I figured out how to load it. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, here we go again. So we're speeding down about 50, 60 miles an hour down to the church. And when we get there, nobody is there. And I'm, I'm relieved that nobody is there. And so the next day, I'm back on the flight back to Seattle. And so that was my baptism into the Black Panther Party. And I realized what we have to do in Seattle and what it means to be a member of the Black Panther Party. So right after the Seattle chapters formed the Black Panther Party, uh, starts opening chapters and branches all across the country, just spreads like wildfire. And uh, not only is the Black Panther Party being formulated, but there's other organizations that are also uh, being formulated as well, like the Brown Marais, which was started in Los Angeles among the Latino population. And there was a Black Marais in the southwest part of the country. There was an um, American Indian movement that began to formulate. And there was the, uh, the Red Guard, which was an organization that a lot of Asian students began to join. And there was SDS, and there was the Weather Underground, and many other uh, radical organizations. So, uh, you know, young people had decided that it was time for more a radical organization. And the Black Panther Party really understood the importance of broad coalition building, because we understood that this movement wasn't just about black people, but it was about creating a better world for everybody. And so we built broad coalitions. One of the first coalitions that we had a, a coalition with was the Peace and Freedom Party, which was a white liberal organization out of the California. And through the Peace and Freedom Party, we ran political candidates for political office. And we also developed coalitions with the Brown Berets and the Young Patriot Party and, and American Indian Movement and many of these other organizations. And so now, G. Edgar Hoover, Richard Nixon, Attorney General John Mitchell, they're getting real nervous about this organization called the Black Panther Party. They began to create and develop this program called COINTELPRO. And, uh, and they had said amongst themselves, we didn't know that they had said amongst themselves they were going to have us wiped out by 1969. So, um, uh, and, uh, you know, there were some chapters and branches that were heavily infiltrated, so heavily infiltrated that they never got off the ground. And there were people that were arrested, like in the Baltimore chapter was started by the FBI, but one of the brothers who was in the Baltimore chapter was arrested and charged with conspiracy. And he's in, been in prison to this very day for 45 years. Same thing happened in New Jersey, same thing happened in uh, Nebraska where two young Panthers uh, began to organize the Nebraska chapter of the Black Panther Party, uh, the infiltration, and uh, caused them to get arrested and charged with conspiracy, and they've been in prison for 45 years. And so this was a tremendous assault that was being led on the Black Panther Party. In L.A., Southern California, there was Bunchy Carter, the Deputy Minister of Information, the Deputy Minister of Defense of the Southern California chapter, Bunchy Carter had been head of the largest gang in L.A. called the Slossons. When he got out of San Quentin, he left the Slossons and joined the Black Panther Party. A lot of those members of the Slossons 
came and joined up with him. And, um, and through, through the whole era, this is never talked about, but during the whole era of the Black Panther Party, gang warfare in America stopped because we would not allow it. But in 1969, January 1969, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins, the two leaders of the Southern California chapter, were assassinated on UCLA campus as they were organizing the Black Studies program at UCLA campus. They were assassinated by the US organization, which the FBI had been uh, instigating uh, them against the Black Panther Party. So the Southern California chapter never would recover from the loss of Bunchy Carter and John Huggins. A year later, in Chicago, there's a young man named Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was, I mean, if you don't know who Fred Hampton is, when you get home, Google him, look him up, there's films about him, everything about him. But anybody who met Fred Hampton knew that this was a very special young man. And I had a chance to meet Fred Hampton in 1969 in Chicago. We spoke in 1968. We spoke at the University of Chicago together. When I met this guy, well, he was just a year older than me, but I was like, oh my God, this guy is an amazing human being. Because Fred Hampton loved humanity. He loved people. He loved to fight for justice. When he was growing up, he used to read and study Martin Luther King's speeches and study Malcolm X's speeches. And when he went to church, the pastor would ask him to say something because they knew that something that Fred was always going to say something articulate. He was always involved in the community. And so Fred Hampton would get up in front of church every Sunday and, and talk about what he observed in the community. And, and this is the type of Fred Hampton was. He, he organized, when he was in high school, he organized uh, his school to bring more black teachers into the school. He even did organize in the community to raise the pay of the police officers in the community so they could do a better job. You know, he was a humanitarian. He was a true humanitarian. So when he organized the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party, one of the first things he does, he goes down to the Black Gangster Disciples, the Blackstone Rangers, two largest gangs in the world, and tells them that they're going to stop fighting each other, or they're going to have to deal with the Black Panther Party. So one of those gangs joins up with the Black Panther Party. The other gang, the FBI had already got to and so that, that they, they didn't come on board. And so the next thing that Fred Hampton does, he goes to the poor white community in Chicago. He starts meeting with the activists there. And he uh, meets Cha-Cha Jimenez, head of the Puerto Rican gang called the Young Lords. He convinces Cha-Cha to change the name to the, the, to, for the, the Young Lords to be a political organization. And he formed the first Rainbow Coalition. Fred Hampton formed the first Rainbow Coalition. Blacks whites and Latinos in Chicago. And be, at this point, he becomes the number one threat to Mayor Daley, who had been mayor for 34 years. And so the FBI has, has got uh, Fred Hampton uh, a target for assassination. Now, by this time, when we joined the Republican Party, we were told we had to have 2,000 rounds of ammunition and two weapons. We were also given a book list of 25 books, told we had to read uh, twice a day, we had political education class twice a week. We had to read all those books on that list. And we were always changing. We were taught that nothing stands outside a chain. So we were always changing as a political organization. Because we wanted to create a revolution to change America. To make America a better place for everyone. So, um, uh, you know, we started what was called a free breakfast for school children program. We, they passed gun legislation so that it made it illegal for us to carry weapons in open illegal for us to carry weapons in Seattle. So we turned our attention to developing community-based programs because the Vietnam War was taking away a lot of resources from the community people. There was a lot of poverty. So we said, okay, how is Jim, little Jimmy going to learn the five apples and one apple, six apples, he ain't even had an apple. So we started the first fifth breakfast, breakfast for school children program. That was our first major program. We opened up these breakfast programs all across the country. You know, pretty soon in Seattle, we were feeding 500 kids every single day. Chicago was feeding 1,000 kids. New York chapter was feeding 1,000 kids. L.A. chapter was feeding hundreds and thousands of kids. And so when the, the, the police started coming down in Chicago and L.A., they went into the breakfast program with guns to scare the kids away. Um, and pretty soon we were feeding thousands of kids all across the country. We weren't getting any government funds for this. Then we recognized that there was no community medical clinics at that time. 
So we got orders to open up a medical clinics all across the country. So we, we opened up the first medical clinic in Seattle, uh, the first free medical clinic in the Northwest. And, and San Francisco is a brand, we opened up 11 medical clinics all across the country in, in, in LA and uh, New York. The LA chapter in Harlem, they started a free ambulance program. And North Carolina chapter in Winston-Salem, they also started a free ambulance program. Because there was always a running joke in the black community. If you call 911 for an ambulance, it's not going to come. So we said, fine, you ain't going to come, we'll get our own ambulance program. We started a free ambulance program. We opened up free medical clinics. And then we started um, uh, the food program. Now they have food banks today. It was the Black Panther Party that began to give out bags of groceries out of our community centers every single week. We started giving out bags of groceries to people and families. We also started a free shoe program. We got shoes donated from big businesses. We gave out brand new shoes to kids that didn't have shoes. We gave out uh, clothing, brand new clothes to people. We started a free busing to prisons program. We were going on to start over 35 community-based programs. One of them was the free legal aid program because we recognized a lot of people could not afford uh, to see an attorney. So we got attorneys to volunteer their time to come to our community centers twice a week and people from the community could come in and meet with, with uh, an attorney. Now, though three of those programs, the federal government became national programs. That's the breakfast program, and that's the free medical clinics, and the free legal aid program. In 1974, they allocated money for community-based uh, uh, medical clinic because there weren't any small medical clinics at that time. So it was the Black Panther Party that really set in motion why we have community clinics now. Even though those clinics aren't necessarily free, but they are more affordable. Um, and also they did the same thing with the breakfast program. 1974, they allocated money for a national breakfast program. The reason why kids have been getting breakfast and lunch at school at reduced rate for the last 40 years is because of the Black Panther Party. And, and they also allocated money for the, uh, for the, um, for the uh, free legal aid program. I recently needed to go talk to an attorney. I went to the uh, City of Seattle Community Service Center and I heard that I could sign up to talk to an attorney and I'm sitting across from this young attorney and I'm, I'm at, I said, do you know how this program got started? He didn't know it. I had to educate him. It's because the Black Panther Party started the first free legal aid program in 1969. So, um, you know, in, in December, we were working as Black Panther Party members, we were working, you know, 18 hours a day. You know, we'd have to get up in the morning, we have to go to the breakfast program, make sure that was running, and we have to come back, we had to sell 100 papers, every Panther had orders to sell 100 papers every day. Uh, and we had to work in our program, so we were working nonstop, we were working we were just totally focused on dedicated working for the people. And uh, so in the, uh, in, the, in the morning, in the evening of December 3rd, Fred Hampton was meeting with his uh, staff because we had to be well organized. We had to plan everything out just right to be able to carry off all the things that we were doing. And he did not know that his, uh, his security here was the FBI informant and had given the layout to Fred Hampton's home to the FBI. And um, at the, on the morning of December 4th, there was a knock on the door at 4 in the morning. Mark Clark, 19 years old, uh, goes to the door because he's on guard duty because we got orders we had to be on guard duty uh, at night because they were raiding our offices and arresting people. We had to sandbag and fortify our offices. Uh, so Mark Clark goes to the door, there's a knock on the door, he says, who is it? Shaq goes through the door and kills him instantly. Simultaneously, the FBI Chicago police burst through the rear door, they go into the front room, they, there's eight Panthers on the floor asleep, he gets them up, they machine gun them, they go into Fred Hampton's room, his wife tries to wake him up, she's six months pregnant, he won't wake up because he's been drugged by the FBI informant. She lays on top of him uh, to protect him. And uh, she, the police come in, they drag her off of him, and drag her into the other room, they go back into the bedroom where he's laying, and they shoot him in the head three times. That's how afraid of this 21-year-old man that they were. 
that they would kill him in his sleep. And we had gotten hold of some documents earlier before uh, that said, uh, they were from the FBI, that said if there is a black messiah, that the black messiah must be killed. And Fred Hampton was that black messiah. That was one of the saddest days of my life at the Black Panther Party when Fred Hampton was killed. I had already been to, you know, several Panther funerals. And to this very day, it's, it's still the saddest day of my life because Fred Hampton was somebody who could have made a difference in the world. Just like Martin Luther King, just like Malcolm X, just like John F. Kennedy, just like Medgar Evers, just like Robert Kennedy. All those, those great minds could have made a difference in where we are today in the world. But they were assassinated instead at a very young age. And, um, and the Chicago chapter, uh, the next day they organized a tour of over 1,000 people to go through that house because the media came out the very next day and said Panthers shoot at police. And the Panthers never got off a shot, not one single shot. And they showed the bullets that came from the outside in. There were no shots from the inside out. And they showed the bloody matches that Fred Hampton died on, that he died on. And over a thousand people saw this and they knew that this was murder. Outright murder. And over 30 members of the Black Panther Party would be killed from 1968 till 1971. And, um, but you know, this, this never stopped us from what we were doing. You know, this never stopped us from our goal of organizing and creating a more just society. You know, they, you know when the, the women's movement uh, came about because of the Black Panther Party, because of the work of the Black Panther Party. And we, we began to work with the women organizations and we supported them. We wrote letters in our newspapers supporting the women's movement. The same with the gay rights movement. We wrote that, Huey wrote a letter in support of the gay rights movement because we said anybody who is oppressed, anybody who is discriminated against is, uh, has our support and that we were fighting for all oppressed people as well. And so, um, you know, the Black Panther Party would go on to uh, run political candidates, but Shirley Chisholm, uh, the first black congresswoman, decided that she was gonna run for president. It was a Black Panther Party that first ran to support her. A lot of the black politicians wouldn't support her because they were thinking, who is this black woman? Who is this woman saying she's gonna run for president? So they didn't even want to support her, but we understood the significance of Shirley Chisholm running for president. We understood the significance of black people being involved in the political process. Because we also ran Bobby Seale for mayor and Elaine Brown for city council in Oakland in 1972, giving out 10,000 bags of groceries to kick, kick that campaign off with the chicken in every bag. And you could imagine you know, 10,000 bags spread out on the floor of the open auditorium, you know, and that's a lot of bags to fill, you know, putting a, a bag of potatoes in each bag, a loaf of bread, and, uh, a, a canned food, and, uh, you know, a frozen chicken, you know, and when we kicked off the campaign at the open auditorium, Bobby Seale threw his hat out into the audience and the curtain goes up and there's 5,000 bags of groceries with the chicken in every bag, we gave out, you know, 5,000 bags, and we gave out another 5,000 bags in Oakland. And we also tested uh, 3,000 kids for sickle cell anemia because sickle cell anemia was a disease that affects mostly black people. A lot of black people didn't know about sickle cell anemia. We ran a whole expose in our newspaper about sickle cell anemia and what type of disease it is and how it affects you. And we went out and, and tested thousands of young people all across the country with sickle cell anemia. We were the first organization to really do preventative medicine. So by 1976, even though we weren't successful in that campaign in 1972, we came extremely close to winning and a lot of politicians recognized we had a political campaign, that we had a political machine. When, um, when uh, Jerry Brown decides to run for governor the first time around, he comes to the Black Panther Party and asks for our support. We support his campaign. When he becomes governor, he calls us up and says that he has six positions for attorneys to become judges. We give him the names of these six black attorneys, and these six black attorneys become judges. 
1976, we approached Lionel Wilson, and we had, he's a former Superior Court judge, he's a good friend of Huey's. We asked him if he wanted to be mayor, he said, yeah, we ran this campaign, and we put the first black mayor into office in Oakland, the Black Panther Party. And when he, he doesn't know anything about running a city, he doesn't know anything know about community events, so we're in the office running the city. The Black Panther Party takes over the city of Oakland, uh, in 1976. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, we, and we paved the way for other black politicians to be elected around the country. Um, so by 1978, the Black Panther Party goes out of existence for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one of it is because a lot of large amounts of cocaine was put on the streets of Oakland. Here we did become addicted to, uh, to snorting cocaine because it was a casual drug at the time and affected his judgment, and he pretty much um, ran off a lot of people in the Black Panther Party, and that was the end of the Black Panther Party. So, you know, here we are 40 years later. Uh, you know, anybody who is from my time period, uh, the 80s and 90s was like a nightmare. You know, any time when the streets are now run by young people, instead of older people. Because when I was growing up, all the, all the illegal activities in the community was done by older people. I'm talking about people in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And they had, they had a value system. They had certain things that you didn't do. Even while you were doing illegal things, there were certain things you didn't do. You didn't sell drugs to kids. You know, you always respected the elders in the community. And now that got flipped around because um, after the elimination of the Black Panther Party, we began to move in a new era, uh, particularly when Ronald Reagan gets in office. You know, the, 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 the community structure that used to be in place when I was growing up was no longer there. The, um, the, the value system that I grew up with uh, was non-existent. And so uh, the CIA is very well documented that the CIA in the early 80s were the ones that were bringing truckloads and plane loads of cocaine into America, you know, and the crack cocaine epidemic began. They were not only bringing cocaine, they were bringing guns as well. And a lot of these guns ended up in, 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 in the hands of these young people. Now the Crips that started in L.A., the Crips were starting out because they wanted to emulate the Black Panther Party. The R and the Crips started, stood for revolution. And so they were doing some community programs, but they, they were, there were no Black Panther Party members around to mentor them and teach them that they had to have an ideology, that they had to have a structure, and they had to have a worldwide view. And so because of that, because there were many party members who were dead or in prison or were suffering from those years that they were in the Black Panther Party, there was nobody around to step up and teach these young people the proper way of community, uh, uh, starting a community-based or organization. At the same time, you had all these drugs starting to come into the country. And you had a lot of the factory-based jobs that people used to be able to get and make a good living and take care of their families. All those uh, types of jobs start closing up so these young people didn't have any jobs. So it was very natural for them to start moving into, uh, you know, uh, selling this new drug called crack, and the gang started to proliferate, and it spread it just spread across the country, and, and more and more adults became addicted to, to drugs. The family structure really began to break down. You had kids raising themselves, and I was a gang gang worker in the 80s and 90s, as were many Black Panther Party members, and I had firsthand experience of seeing the breakdown of a family and the breakdown of the community. And Ronald Reagan starts pushing the neoconservative policies and deregulating everything and, and, uh, and, and closing up the mental institutions and, and homeless. That's the first time I really began to see homelessness in the 80s because when I was growing up, we didn't see homeless people. You know, you didn't see homeless people. Uh, and, and now today in Los Angeles, we have the second largest homeless encampment in the world. In Los Angeles, in the shadows of Hollywood, you got the second largest homeless encampment of 50,000 people here in New York. 
New York City, you got 20,000 homeless kids. How is it that we are the richest country in the world? And we got 20,000 homeless kids in a major city in America? No, that's not right. Something's not right. So, uh, you know, they've tried to keep a lid on the movement of the, of the 60s. They've tried to keep a lid on what the Black Panther Party was truly about because they never want to see that happen again. They don't want to see young black people, Latino and young Asian and Native American and white youth realizing that they got a power to change this country. And so I'm glad that's, that's why I wrote this book because I felt it was important for young people to know about that time of history. And that's why I've committed myself to traveling around the country and talking to many people, particularly young people as I can. And so hopefully, uh, you know, that the Occupy movement has, has put it in our minds that we are the 99%. And there's only 1% of the people that control all the resources in this country. And the corporations have taken over this country. They have taken it over. And they don't, you know, Michael Jackson wrote the song. They don't care about us. Go back and watch that video. Because that was true. They don't care about us. All they want from us is to consume. That's all they want for us to do, even though they don't give the resources for us to do all the shopping that they want us to do. But that's the only role that we play for them. That, isn't that what George Bush said when 9-11 happened? Just go shopping. Just go shopping. And so, uh, you know, Americans are in a zombie state. We, you know, we don't have, there used to be a lot of alternative newspapers in every city, every small town, they had an alternative newspaper. They don't have alternative newspapers anymore. There's only one media. That's the main media. And they don't tell you the truth. They tell you half-truths. And when you are told a half-truth, you believe that. But they don't tell you all the other things that are behind that. And so we, we've been kind of low to sleep. We've been brainwashed by the constant media. Now, when I was growing up, we only had four channels, you know, and, and you know, four, five, seven, eleven, and at 12 o'clock, they went off. Now they got 500 channels. You can watch movies all day. And, 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 and uh, they're constantly bombarding us. Now we have this other technology, the iPhones and the iPads, and, you know, I get on the plane, and everybody's got their head buried in the, in the thing. Nobody's talking to each other. I went to a club one time. And we're waiting for the band to come on. And I looked around, everybody's texting and sending messages. Nobody's talking to each other. When I was growing up, it was very, we didn't have this individualism that we have today. We had, we were very much a communal society when I was growing up. You could easily go to next door and get an a, a, a egg from Mrs. Jones or borrow a cup of sugar. You can't do that anymore. You can't do that because we don't even know our neighbors. So we got to get back to that. We got to we got to realize that we're all in this boat together. We got to get back to the communalism and understand individualism doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for people of color. It doesn't work for poor people. Maybe if you're rich, you want to be an individualism. Maybe that'll work for you, but it doesn't work for us. And so I'm hoping that we can wake up, we can get out of this zombie state, and come back and realize that we got the power. Because we used to say all power to the people. Brown power to brown people, yellow power to yellow people, red power to red people, and black power to black people. The people have the power. Thank you. All power to the people. Thank you, Aaron. Come on, make a little bit more noise for Aaron here. I don't know if you can do that. Aaron is going to stay with us for a little bit. He will be available to talk to and also for book signing. So if you want to spend a moment with Aaron, please feel free to do so. And thank you so much, Aaron, for taking time out of your schedule to come be with us. Great thanks to Student Activities, Jason and Deb, and also to Betsy for helping get this uh, off the ground. Thanks to all of you for coming out. And thanks to the Toastmasters Club on campus and also the Afro-Latino Society.
Thank you.